deliver my soul. He said, I beg thee, Lord. He said, deliver my soul. Amen. And, and I, I love the, the remainder of this chapter tonight. I won't get into all of it, but I just love the scripture that David, here, David says right here. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord, deliver my soul. Amen. He's begging for God to deliver his soul. If you ever find yourself lost tonight, I can promise you, you'll be begging God to deliver you from the pains of hell. Amen. You'll be begging God to deliver you from, from the sins of this world. He says, I found trouble and sorrow, and trouble and sorrow will find you. Amen. You'll get in an altar, and you'll realize you lost. you realize you need to be saved, and you'll call upon God, and you'll get in a beggar's condition before you ever get saved. That's one common denominator I think that we all have. Those that are saved tonight, we all found ourselves in a place where we was begging God to save us. Amen. You say, preacher, I didn't get it like that. If you weren't begging God to save you, you probably didn't get saved. Amen. Because when you, when you find out where you're headed and you find out that you have a sin problem and you're headed to hell, you realize that God is your only hope. And David said in Psalms 40, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me. He heard my cry. Amen. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit and he, he set my feet upon a solid rock and he established my goings. What he's saying is I was down in a pit and I could not get out. And he said, I cried unto the Lord to save me and to pull me out. And when you find yourself lost tonight, You'll be in a place to get saved. I think about what Brother Joel Hyatt said a couple weeks ago. We heard him preach in a meeting uh, not far from here, but he said, uh, somebody that's lost out in the woods, you won't have to tell them they're lost. I mean, they'll start crying for somebody to answer them. And if you were to go out in the woods and find yourself lost and go out into Bankhead National Forest and, and lose your way, you don't know where you're at, you don't know which direction is north or south or east or west, and you don't know where in the world you're at and darkness is coming up on you, uh, I can promise you when you get lost, you'll start crying for somebody to help you. Amen? And that's exactly what the sinner do tonight. Thought about all day the message that was preached last night. Brother Randy preached about Nicodemus being saved and uh, finding himself there at the cross of Jesus. And I thought about how Nicodemus, he had the righteousness of a Pharisee, but I told him in the prayer meeting tonight that the Lord said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee, but he found some righteousness that was greater than his own. Amen. And it wasn't impossible for a Pharisee to get born again, and Nicodemus is a good example. Amen. But I think about tonight how you'll need the Lord's righteousness imputed into your life if you want to be saved. You need to, and what the Lord's saying, he's saying, I'll take your sin off of you and I'll put my righteousness upon you, amen. It's like he says, I'll take the burden away and I'll give you rest in return. It, it's, a tra it's, a, it's a wonderful trade-off right there when you get saved, amen. The Lord, he takes the sin, he takes the sorrow, he takes the pain out of our life and he puts peace with God, amen. We have peace with the Lord tonight because we're saved. Paul said in Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Amen. Praise the Lord tonight, I've got peace in my heart. When I lay down at night, I don't wonder if I'm going to heaven, if something were to happen to me. Heard, heard about a man in the prayer room, he was 42, 43 years old, had a heart attack this week and left his family and kids behind. But uh, I thought about how young you can die in this life. You don't have to be 80 years old to pass away. You don't have to be 95 years old to pass away. The Lord, he calls people at all ages. Amen. But I'm glad when I lay down at night, if, if something were to happen to me in the middle of the night, I have that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Amen. And I'd end up in heaven. I wouldn't have to worry about that. And I, I, I preach at the jail on Tuesday nights, and I, I've kind of took a break from that here recently because we've got so much going on. But I tell them inmates all the time, I say, you know, I can't imagine what it would be like to lay uh, in, in bed in a jail cell not knowing what your future might hold. I, 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 and I try to offer some consolation to them and say, hey, the best thing you can do is get saved. That way you know it gets a whole lot better than this. Amen. And, and, and I can promise you, if you have the Lord in, in, down deep in your heart tonight, that you'll have peace and you can have comfort in knowing that one day you'll be with the Lord for all eternity. Amen. Amen. I love the Lord tonight. I, I don't know what I hit. I wish I'd hit it some more. But uh, I, I appreciate the Lord being good to us tonight. I appreciate him stirring our heart by way of remembrance. And he just All week he's been reminding us about the day we got saved. And uh, when, you, when you get saved, you'll have something to rejoice about. Amen. You can rejoice in the Lord. And as Paul said, and again, I say always, he said, I say it again, always rejoice and rejoice in the name of the Lord. We can rejoice in his name tonight because of what he's done for us. At this time, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we feel like it's preaching time. I don't feel the, 
feel the need for testimony service, anything like that tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time, and then we'll go further in the service. After this prayer, Brother Toby's going to come and preach this. Brother Derry Jackson, would you lead us in prayer tonight? I ask the Lord to help us. Go ahead and say again, if you feel the need to come pray at any point in the service tonight, you make your way to the altar. Brother Toby Powers, you come and preach to us tonight if you would. Pastor at Truth Baptist Church in Bremen, Georgia, you pray for him tonight. God bless you. Turn with me, please, if you will, in your Bible to the book of Job in chapter 1. Book of Job in chapter 1. As you're turning, I'll say it is a blessing to get to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Good to see each one of you here this evening. We're grateful to be in this place at this time with each one of you. We are thankful for your humble pastor, for the invitation to come this way. I appreciate the Lord allowing me to uh, have he and his family as uh, counted as friends. They've been a blessing to us and uh, to my family, and I'm grateful for it. Grateful to be back again with you. Uh, it's always a privilege to get to go anywhere and try to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's even a greater privilege to get to go somewhere a second time. And uh, there's a lot of places that I, in the last 33 years or 34 years or whatever it's been now, that the Lord has let me preach once, and uh, that was about all that me or them, either one, could handle. And uh, to get to come back a second time is a privilege anywhere, and there are places where I've been going every year for 25 or 30 years, but those folks are just glutton for punishment, I guess. Um, they're either that or just merciful. A fellow told me recently, he asked me, he said, how long have you been pastoring there at Truth? And I said, well, it'll be at the time it was going, coming up on our 25th anniversary, 26 years now. And he said, my soul, he said, that, uh, that either means you're real easy to get along with or real hard to get shed of, one of the two. And uh, so you letting me come back is a tremendous privilege, and I want to thank you for that. Appreciate these good men that have preached these nights and days before us. Uh, Brother Randy and Brother John are fine men, great preachers on a very short list of close friends that I have in the ministry, and I appreciate them, and I know they've shared the word of the Lord with you. I want to, I want to tell you thank you for the singing tonight. That was good, the choir singing. I'm so thankful you all sung that song, When He Blessed My Soul. And if it was not sung tonight, I was going to put in a request before the end of the week for us to get to it. So I'm glad we sung that. Would have been worth the drive to hear these young'uns begin to sing, Jesus Loves Me, and the very little phrase, This I Know. I don't know a lot in this world anymore. Seems like everything I used to think I know, I don't seem to know anymore. I have so many questions. There are burdens by the dozens weighing heavy on my heart tonight. I, I, Brother Lester Olaf told us years ago, if you're a preacher, he said, don't ever let folks know if you're down or if you're heavy because he said, ain't nobody wants a sick, wore-out preacher. And so I'm not sick and worn out, but I'd be fibbing if I said there's not a lot of things on my heart and my mind tonight that have me puzzled. I have family members that are very sick. I have some that are not in good shape and whatever, and my family at home needs help from the Lord these days. My heart, my hit, my mind it needs help from the Lord these days. There's a lot of things I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow holds on a lot of things. I'm concerned for people that I love. And uh, the Lord knows my heart about that. There's a number of things. But one thing I know that the Lord helped me tonight with, with the little boys and girls singing, I do know that the Lord loves me. And uh, matter of fact, I know that he loves me so much that there's not a thing in the world I can do about it. 
He's going to love me no matter what. I can tell you about when I first began to love the Lord, but I can't tell you about when he first started loving me. He always has, and he always will. I mean, his love is from everlasting unto everlasting. And when I don't know anything else, I know that much. The Lord loves me. When I don't know how things will go, I don't know what decisions to make. I am finding myself in much of a fog. I'm thankful that I can know that the Lord loves me. And he's looking out for me. He has my best interest in mind. And I can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was a great help to my heart. And I appreciate you boys and girls singing tonight. Everything that's been done, I praise the Lord for it. We're reading from the book of Job. If you are able and willing and have found your place, I would invite you to stand with us and we'll reverence the reading of the word of the Lord tonight in Job in chapter number 1. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 6 is where we'll begin our reading and we'll remain in this chapter and in this book of the word of the Lord for the entirety of the message. And I'd ask you to pray for us that God would help us and use us this evening. <sighs> Job in chapter 1. And in verse number 6, the word of the Lord says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. I have so many questions about that verse that I'll never answer, questions that you can't answer. I have ideas, and you have ideas, but we don't know a lot of things for sure. I don't know what this scene looks like that day. I don't know exactly what's going on when they present themselves. I don't know that I know for sure who these sons of God are that are presenting themselves. As I say, I have ideas. One thing I do know is whoever these sons of God are and however they are presenting themselves before the Lord, the devil makes sure it doesn't happen without his nasty presence being also there as well. And if you ever try to do anything for the Lord at all, you can mark her down that if you will do good, evil is present with you. The devil is not going to let you just serve the Lord and stay out of your way and mind his own business. He's just not going to do that. He will interfere at every turn. Do all he can to gum up the works and every time you do your very best, he's going to be standing there shaking his finger in your face and doing all he can to stop whatever you're doing for God and for what's right. And he did the same with Job. And the Lord said unto Satan, this is where the story really takes an unusual turn. Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered unto the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. We know that according to 1 Peter chapter 5 that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's what he's walking up and down for is looking for somebody to eat up. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? God is making suggestions to the devil of people he could attack. Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Dost Job fear God for naught? Hast, thou, hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand that now touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Our text is really from verse number 8 this evening and then companion portions in the book of Job. And I want to preach if the Lord will help me for a few moments on God's testimony about Job. God's testimony about Job. You can be seated this evening. Thank you graciously for standing with us while I read the word of the Lord. I believe to have one's name mentioned in the Bible at all is extraordinary. To have the God of the Bible, the God of heaven, actually provide a testimony in a person's behalf is hardly imaginable. When any of us stand in the presence of God, we realize as Isaiah did, I, Lord, I'm, I am undone. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. We realize as the apostle Paul did when we see ourselves in light of the Lord, 
Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, my friend, we think about as the apostle Peter said when he realized he was in the presence of the Lord and he said, get away from me, Lord. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. He realized he was not worthy to be in the presence of God. The Bible declares that as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No person who's right with God or even has a shred of sanity gets in the presence of the Lord and begins to pat themselves on the back and to feel great about who they are and what they've done and their record and how awesome they are. We find ourselves unworthy before the Lord and how great He is and how small we are. And yet the Lord who cannot lie, I mean he cannot lie, takes some occasions in the Bible to testify about some of his saints and when he starts talking about Job, he talks about Job in a whole different manner than what Job in the presence of the Lord would talk about himself. Job began to see himself and he said, I'll repent before you in sackcloth and ashes. Job saw himself and he said, man's like the flower of the field. He's like the grass that fadeth away. Had Job saw himself and realized he was inadequate to face Satan and he was inadequate for the days ahead and he said that he's born a few days and full of trouble. But when God saw Job and he testified of Job, he said he's an upright man. He's one that fears the Lord. He eschews evil. He's a perfect man. Matter of fact, he's my servant. Hast thou considered my servant, Job? He's my servant. There is none like him in all the earth. When the Lord talks about Job, God gives a glowing endorsement of this man that we find recorded in the Word of God. And I find this especially striking when the Lord testifies. He takes the stand, the witness stand, and he tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. For he cannot lie, and he's always under oath. And what he says about man must be true. And he testifies about Job. And instead of saying all the things that you or I or Job could have said negative about him, the Lord said he's a perfect man, he's an upright man, he fears the Lord, and he eschews evil. Oh, my friend, I wonder if the Lord were to take the stand, the witness stand, go under oath as he always is, and testify of your life or of mine what he would say. If he stepped up to the microphone and gave a word of testimony, and the Lord be, and the, the devil began asking him about all of us, and he called your name, and he called my name, would the Lord say of us the th same kind of thing that he said about Brother Job in our passage of Scripture? He cannot say it if it is not true. He will not lie on our behalf. How when we stand before him one day in the judgment, how he is going to testify about our lives. And he will judge the secrets of men according to his son, Jesus Christ. And when he does, he'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We say we want to hear him say, well done, how thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear him say that. I realize tonight he cannot say well done if I do not do well. I must do well if I want to hear him say well done. When he testifies of your life, when Satan comes and presents himself with the sons of God before the Lord and your name is brought up, what will the Lord say about you and about me? Job was a man of high character. He was a man of great integrity. He was totally trustworthy. And men like Job in every generation are in short supply. And Job in his day was in a class all by himself. He was the best that the Lord had. He was the greatest man in all the East, the Bible said. And the Lord said there is none like him. Oh, my friend God testified of this matter. It's remarkable and hard to even fathom what the Lord would say about any of us but this was his testimony about Job and I pray that the Lord would help me that it may be his testimony about me. Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man. One that feareth God and one that escheweth evil. Now we, what we know most about Job is all the trouble he went through. About all the problems that he had. About everything that he lost. All the great suffering that he goes through later in this chapter. And then the, my friend in the next chapter and the following chapter. And then the, the uh, bewilderment 
bewilderment he experiences uh, for the next 40 chapters of this book and how puzzled he is uh, at the attacks of Satan and what goes on in his life. Uh, but my friend, I cannot fathom that there's a more important verse in this book of the Bible uh, than verse number 8 when God speaks up and tells us who this man Job really is. Uh, and the Lord testifies. There are really just four little things that I have in this little message here tonight that I want to share with you about God's testimony concerning Job. When the Lord testifies, He tells us who a man is. I think oftentimes I think about these testimonies. You know the Lord testified about Abraham in the book of Genesis. He said, for I know him. How do you realize if the Lord doesn't know you tonight, you're going to be in trouble in eternity. How the reason why men will be cast into hell is because He will say, depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I never knew you. How about he said of Abraham, I know him. Would he say that about you? Does he know you? Do you know the Lord tonight? When he testified about Saul, my friend, the, uh, the prophet Ananias said, I don't know if I want to go down there or not. I have heard of what Saul has done, of the havoc he's created. But the Lord said, go on down there to where he is, at the place called Straight. I said, he's a chosen vessel unto me. That's what the Lord said about Saul. He told, testified about Abel in the book of Hebrews. His testimony about Abel was that he was righteous. When the devil begins to rail against you, he's the accuser of the brethren. And he begins to tell the Lord how dirty and low down and no count you are. Will the Lord testify on your behalf and say he's righteous? On what grounds, Lord? On the grounds of the blood of the Lamb. That's how he's made righteous. He spoke up of David in the book of Acts as they looked at him in hindsight. And the Lord said of David, he's a man after my own heart. I wonder, are you? Am I? The Lord spoke about John the Baptist and testified about John. And he said, while some of my friend were mocking him for sending two disciples unto Jesus and asking, art thou he that should come or should we look for another? He said, I'll tell you about John the Baptist. He's the greatest that was ever born of a woman. What high praise from a God who cannot lie. And yet he said the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That is Job being of the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he said those that will receive the gospel and know what it is to be saved in that New Testament kingdom. And those that know what it is to be born again in the dispensation the church will be greater than even the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And then tonight we're looking at Job and what the Lord said about him. He's my servant. He is one that fears God and eschews evil. He walks upright. He's my kind of guy. And the Lord gives a glowing endorsement in his testimony about Brother Job. There's four things I want to mention to you out of verse number 8 tonight. And that will be the finishing of the message this evening. First of all, God said that Job was a man of completion. He was a man of completion. God called him a perfect and an upright man. Now that's a hard phrase for a lot of folks to receive. A perfect and an upright man. When it says that he is a perfect man, a perfect and upright, this term does not mean flawless. Uh, this perfection means mature. Uh, the term perfect literally means to have reached full stature. He was mature. He was morally complete. He was gentle and blameless and pious and committed. Uh, this doesn't mean that Job was flawless. It doesn't mean that he never did anything wrong. It does not mean that he ever failed or that he never failed in his life. It doesn't mean he never came short. It does mean that he was complete. There were no gaping holes in Job's commitment to God and commitment to living right. He had no glaring weaknesses in his spiritual walk. Would the Lord say that about you or about me? That there are no glaring weaknesses? That there are no gaping holes in our code of morality? that we don't have habitual sin 
in our lives that we are daily seeking and striving to walk before him in a way that's pleasing unto the Lord How Satan thought Job was a materialist the only reason why he loves you Lord is because you've been so good to him you gave him all that stuff if he didn't have all that stuff he wouldn't love you the only reason why he loves you is because he loves his stuff and he accused Job of being a materialist Satan accused Job of being selfish he just loves all that he has and if you take away what he has he'd curse you to his to your face and Satan accused Job of being ungrateful he doesn't really know how to appreciate you God he doesn't know how to appreciate that hedge that you have about him if you take it down I'll show you Job is not everything you think he is he's not the man you say he is what you're saying God is wrong I'll show you what kind of man Job really is if you'll just let me at him and God my friend if he were talking about you or me he might would have had to say I better make sure I secure them because if the devil ever gets a hold of brother Toby there ain't no telling how right the devil will be about just how far short he'll come of the glory of God but brother Job I have confidence in if the devil tears his family to shreds Job will love God anyway if he takes away all his sheep and his oxen and his cattle he'll love God anyway if ever chicken in the poultry house dies on the same day he'll love the Lord anyway and Job just trusted God and loved God and the Lord knew this would happen before the trouble ever came and the devil didn't know what had happened but the Lord knew and the Lord knew that Job would not turn on him that Job would be faithful he's mature he's consistent he's complete he's right he's real and Job become our friend as a kind of man that confessed his sins regularly he offered sacrifices and he prayed continually verse number 5 and the Bible said he offered sacrifice for his children and he prayed for his family and thus did Job continually thus did Job continually and Job was a praying man oh I appreciate how the Lord helped my heart in that verse this afternoon we are to pray without ceasing thus did Job continually do you realize Job prayed for his wife how when she didn't always treat him right I mean Job's wife went through a lot I'm not going to pick on Mrs. Job tonight lots of preachers do I don't pick on her how she buried her children too she lost her well too she went through a lot with him and the Lord didn't promise that she wouldn't go sideways or that she wouldn't have problems he just knew about Job but I'm going to tell you what Job did when his wife didn't always treat him right he still prayed for her continually I wonder if the Lord could say that about you and me how when your spouse doesn't treat you right how whenever your family doesn't do you right when you think the person that's supposed to love you does not treat you with the respect that you deserve or how that you think they ought to how do you pray for them all the same how do you do so continually he prayed for his wife when she didn't treat him right how first Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 says how that if you don't honor your wife it will hinder your prayers how that you do this that your prayers be not hindered and Job said no matter what my wife does or does not do she can talk like a foolish woman and I'm not going to stop praying for her he did this continually Job prayed for his children when he didn't even know what they did wrong he offered sacrifice for them and said maybe they've cursed God in their hearts and are not even aware of it and he prayed for them even though he didn't know what they did and he prayed for them continually Job prayed for his friends who had been too harsh with him and had my friend not to judge him properly and had to cast railing accusation on him but Job chapter 42 and verse 10 says that God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends praise God in the land I tell you a man that will pray for his wife or her, a woman that will pray for her husband when they're gone off the rails a, man, a parent that will pray for their children when they don't know whether they're living right or not a person who will pray for their friends when they pat them on the back with a knife in their hand it will take walking close to God it will take a, a mature Christian life it will take some uh, growing up in Jesus in us 
in order to do that but that's the kind of man that Job was and I want to show you how Job survived all these attacks of the devil Oftentimes we've wondered about this has been a discussion of people ever since the book of Job's been written how does he survive such a thing how does he stand up and withstand in such a day in the book of James he talks about how you have heard of the patience of Job I mean Job goes through all of these things but there is a key in my estimation to Job surviving these things where so many others have buckled under much less pressure than what Job had on him hey you see there's a day that comes along that the devil shows himself uh, when the sons of men present or sons of God present themselves unto the Lord uh, and Satan also comes with him uh, and when he shows up that day the devil starts talking to the Lord about Job uh, but when the devil started talking to the Lord about Job uh, Job was talking to the Lord about the devil amen Job was already talking to the Lord about the devil before the devil already started talking to the Lord about Job uh, Hey, you see how you survived the attacks of Satan?